elders uh, decided that, that we would cover this, the master's plan for the church. And we've really been talking about, since January, the anatomy of the church. What makes up the church? We've talked about the skeletal structure. We've talked about the, the internal systems. We've talked about the muscles, with the activities, the spiritual activities of the church. And this morning, we are talking about the head of the church. Who is in control? Who is in, who is in charge? Is it the preacher? Is it the one that, that occupies this pulpit to deliver a weekly message? You know, a lot of people believe that there is one man, one person, who is over a particular congregation. They, I've, I've often been called pastor when, when I've either been introduced to somebody or introduced myself to someone, and they, they think that I might be the one that's in charge of a congregation. Is that true? Am I in charge? Do we believe it? You know, when we think about who is in charge, you know, sadly a lot of preachers believe that they are in charge. That because they're able to preach and teach and, and, and to have counseling sessions, they kind of get a big head and they think, well, I'm just a little bit higher. I'm a little bit more elevated than everybody else. I want to let you in on a little secret. When I graduated from preaching school, I did not take a magical elixir that now prevents me from sinning. I didn't. I, 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 apparently some preachers get this stuff. I don't. I'm not higher elevated than anyone else in this room. I'm a member. I, I'm a brother in Jesus Christ, and that's all that I am. I just preach God's Word. Now, are the elders in charge of the church? I want you to think about this for just a minute. I'm not saying have they been given delegated authority from a higher power. I'm asking, do they have the ability, the authority to write legislation, to write law in the church? Are they in charge of the church? Do they have that authority? Do you believe it? The preacher does not have the say-so. The eldership, while they have been given authority from a higher power, they themselves are not the authority of the church. There's only one who is head of the church, and that's Jesus Christ. We have to understand that this morning. If we understand that this morning, perhaps there will be less division in Christendom. Perhaps we can be more united. There are not multiple heads to the body. There's only one head to the body, and that's Jesus Christ. As we think about this lesson, as we think about who is in charge, is it any one person, any one man, any one human being, the most important part of the body that is the church is the head. He is the source of not only all authority, but all love and of all salvation. The only salvation we can have today is in Jesus Christ. Amen. So many are, are, are wanting to call Him Rescuer, but very few are willing to call Him Lord. Amen. Is He the head of the church? Now hold on, I know we can all say yes and amen, but if He is head of the church, and if I am part of the church, let's do this math together. He's head of me. He is the Lord of my life. And I have to believe that this morning. Jesus is the head of the church. Now what does that mean? What do we mean when we say Jesus is head? I want to talk about this morning just some descriptions of, of Jesus who is head of the church. What does that mean for my life? What does that mean for your life today? The first thing I want us to notice is that by calling Him the head of the church, that means He is sovereign. He is our Lord. What does the word sovereign mean? If you look it up in the dictionary, the word sovereign refers to one who has complete power and He is the being, the supreme ruler. I want you to think about that. If I call Jesus Lord, if I say He is Lord of my life, I am saying that He has supreme power over my life and He is the one who is in charge. That's an easy thing to say. It's a difficult way to live. Because whenever the title Lord is used in the New Testament referring to Jesus, it is referring to Him as having complete authority. You know, we read, we read in Ephesians 4, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ. What does that mean? If you're with me in Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 19, let's read exactly what that means. 
And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the workings of His great might? That He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above some names, many names, all names, every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And He put all things, all, things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all boy if we underlined all in this passage maybe we would get the point he is head over everyone. He is head over everything. He is the supreme ruler, the supreme being. He is over it all. Like I said so many times, we, we love the idea of Jesus being our Savior. He's the one who delivers us. He's the one who rescues us. But we fail to realize that He is also our Lord and Master. I cannot call Jesus my Savior and fail to acknowledge Him as being my Lord. You know, we are so quick to desire to be rescued from sin Again, we, we don't realize we're being rescued from sin and delivered to live a righteous life. I think about Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, 22. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. Slaves of God. The fruit that you get leads to the sanctification and its end, eternal life. So I've been set free from sin, but now I'm a servant. I'm a slave of God. However, the fruit that I bear in submission to God leads to everlasting life. Well, I want to tell you the truth this morning. If Jesus is not Lord of all, then He is not Lord at all. Are you hearing me this morning? He has to be Lord over everything in your life. He has to be ruler over everything in my life. If He is not the ruler, then Scripture is undermined. If Jesus is not Lord, then He has not overthrown sin. Then our faith is in vain. Then you can live however you want to live because you have no hope of tomorrow. It really comes down to a matter of priority. I think of Matthew 10. I think of Jesus... When he's in the midst of the crowd in Luke 14, and so many are following him, that he gives them a challenge that very few are willing to follow through. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. If I am unwilling to take up the cross and follow Him, I'm not worthy of His name. Now this is when it becomes real. This is when it becomes practical. My schedule is busy. Is it too busy for God? Now here's, here's what I mean. You know, we can get so caught up in our jobs, in our children's after school activities, yeah. in, and I can say this because I understand, in vacation, it's, it's so easy for us to get caught up in, in, in what's going on in our schedule. There's so many hours of the day that, that we, we, we really do try, we really do hope, we really do anticipate having some time for Christ, whether it's attending worship or it's, or it's having a special time to study God's Word or it's attending another event like our, our open house or our vacation Bible school or, or our food program or blankets. So, so many different activities. So little time. And as I look, and here it is on Friday, and I fail to realize that Christ made my schedule. Maybe I'll try better next week. Is Jesus Lord of your life? 
it's so easy to say, it's so difficult to follow through. A great way for us to examine whether or not He is Lord over our lives is, is He even in our schedule this week? Let alone, is He the top of our schedule this week? Is Jesus, as we often say, is He going to play second fiddle? Is He going to be the backup plan? Or is He going to have precedent over every thought, every action, every intention of my life? Is He sovereign? Is He Lord? Can I call Him Master? Can I prove it this morning? I think about Matthew chapter 10 and I realize that it is a warning that by surrendering my life to Christ, that there is this impassable gulf between us and those who do not place Christ first. And Jesus says, I have to love Him more than my own parents, than my own children. But if I learn to love Christ first, if I learn to put Him in the place, the position where He belongs, I will realize I can better love my spouse than I could before. I can better love my parents. I can better love my children because if I put Christ first, I will teach them to put Christ first also. Is He Lord? When I think about these songs that we sing, and I think where He leads, I might follow. That's not what we sing. Where He leads, I'll follow. Trust and maybe obey if I have time. If I think, sung to Jesus, I surrender. I know Willard talked about that just a few weeks ago. All to Jesus, I surrender. Is He Lord? Do I believe He is over all, including me? Because if Jesus is not Lord of all, He is not Lord at all. Second, Jesus is not only sovereign, He is the great shepherd. He is our guide. Now, you you hear this idea about Jesus being sovereign, that He is Lord, and, and you might have this picture of this impersonal Leader, This individual doesn't really care about me or this person that doesn't really know what I'm going through, the challenges I'm facing. You know, If we ended the discussion on Jesus as Lord, yes, we'd have a better understanding of how we ought to submit to Him, but we wouldn't understand His character. I think about David. I think about what David said. We read 1 Samuel 17, 34-35. You know, David's hearing all this, this, this hogwash from Goliath. He's hearing all these, these horrible name-calling situation and how none of Israel has the courage to go against him. And so he says, I'll be the guy. And Saul's kind of, he, he doesn't really know what to think. You know, what, what, what credentials does David have? You know what David says? I am a shepherd. Those were his credentials. I want you to read here. I have it on the screen. Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. When they came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him. I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard. And I struck him and I killed him. Some of us are scared of dogs. Can you imagine going up against a bear? Can you imagine grabbing him by the scruff of his neck and striking him until he died? You know what I read? David went after the sheep. When when a lion came, David offered himself up for the sheep. There's a lion prowling this world today, seeking whom he may devour. Thankfully, we have a great shepherd who is willing to put his life on the line for the sheep. When I think about Jesus being Lord, I realize it's not that He is impersonal, but He is my shepherd. He guides me. He protects me. We have the rod and the staff. As we read about in Psalm 23, Jesus, He's not, as He would talk about in the book of John, He's not some hired hand who does not care for the flock. But he was willing to lay his life on the line. And when danger threatened his flock, he did just that. He is head over my life. He protects me. But also what I read about is that he equips me. 
Look with me in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Just a couple of verses. If you've not learned by now, whenever I put a scripture on, on PowerPoint, sometimes I don't always put it on PowerPoint. Whenever you see it bold and underlined, I typically try to read that passage. You know, it's good to put passages on the screen, but let me tell you, it's even better to open up God's Word and read it for yourself. i got to tell you, I'm, I can make mistakes. God's Word does not have mistakes. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, may this God equip you with everything good that you may do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ to be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, Jesus makes a lot of demands. If He's Lord, He has a lot of expectations. I don't know if I can live up to those expectations. Did you read what we just read together? He equips us. He helps us live to His glory. I think that as I read this passage, I think about what the Hebrew writer is trying to convey to me that it is through Jesus I can live a good life. That He makes me better. That He makes me stronger. That He not only delivers me, but He helps me conform to transform to His will to be more like Him. He would never call me to do something that He Himself has not done in the sense of obeying His Father. Jesus, He protects me. He also equips me. He guides me to live a Christian life. That when I fail to live the Christian life, He has provided a way for me to be restored back to the Father. Because of His death, because of His sacrifice, even we who Christians, who are Christians who struggle with sin, He becomes our great Advocate. See, when I, when I understand that Jesus is head, it's not just that He is this dictator and whatever He tells me to do, I do it. But He is the protector. He is the one who equips. He is the one who makes me better. I think about the end of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So long as I follow the Good Shepherd. Are you following the Good Shepherd? When He pushes you one way, do you realize that perhaps there is a chasm that you're about to fall into? When He causes you to halt, perhaps you fail to realize the thorny bushes that were in your path. Jesus, He is Lord. He is also the Good Shepherd who has laid His life for the sheep for you and me. One more, and the lesson will be yours. Jesus is our Savior, the great Redeemer. One more passage for you. Ephesians 5, verses 21 through 27. He's not just my Redeemer, He's, he's my Rescuer. And I, I know that this passage can be a struggle because it deals with the home. And there are a lot of struggles in the home today. There are a lot of struggles, not just between parents and children, but between husband and wife. In Ephesus at this time, there are a lot of women who are not willing to submit to their husbands. And there are a lot of husbands who are not willing to show selfless love, sacrificial love to their wives. And often when we read Ephesians 5, I can understand the difficulty. Wait, you're telling me I have to submit to Him? You're telling me I have to be passive and let him be over the, the household? That doesn't seem fair. You know, and, and that's, that's perhaps one of the issues is that perhaps we who are husbands, we haven't lived up to our end of the discussion. See, men are called. Yes, women are called. The wives are called to submit to their husbands. But husbands, you are called to love your spouse just as Christ loved the church. It's not the king of his castle. It's the one who is willing to lay his life down for the family. I have to understand that as a husband for my wife, for Erica, that I put her above myself. 
in all things. That I see what is best for our family. Not just now, but for what is to come. That I'm going to be held to a great responsibility. That I'm going to be held to great expectations. And on the day of judgment, I'm going to have to answer for the things I did for the family. Hear what Paul said in Ephesians 5. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. If you have trouble submitting, do it for Christ. Let's start there. Out of reverence, respect for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church. His body and is Himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. That He may sanctify her, that He having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the Word, so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. And I, 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 I hear what Paul is saying, but am I truly living it? Not just referring to the husbands and the wives, that spousal relationship, but I think about what it means that Christ is head of the church. He is Lord. He is the shepherd. But did you read verse 23? He is also the Savior. If Christ is not head of my life, just in these, these few verses, I want you to hear what you're missing out on. If Christ is not head of your life, you cannot, according to verse 26, you cannot be sanctified. You cannot be cleansed. You cannot be presented in splendor. I, I think about my wedding day. Men have it really easy, by the way. I was ready in about 20 minutes and just kind of sat around for the next three hours waiting for the ceremony. But I think about that day and I think about, you know, we waited to have our, our, our photographs taken until after the ceremony because I wanted the first time that I saw my wife to be when those doors opened and open they did. She was so beautiful, arrayed in beautiful white garments. And she's becoming more beautiful every day that I know her. But I think especially at that wedding day, as she was coming down the aisle, perfect. And I knew that things weren't going to be perfect. One reason is because I knew myself. And I knew that I would make mistakes. And I knew she was human and she would make mistakes. But I think about what this verse is saying. Arrayed in splendor. That's how Jesus makes us. I think I'm filthy. I think I'm dirty. I think my garments are torn. I think that I'm ugly, that I have blemishes. I think, who would want me? But Jesus, He, he arrays me in, in splendor. He makes me beautiful. He, he makes me wonderful. He makes me worth having. If only I submit to Him. If, I, if He is not head over my life, I cannot be sanctified. I cannot be cleansed. I cannot be presented in splendor. I cannot be made holy. I, I cannot be made without blemish, without spot. And according to verse 23, if Christ is not head over my life, I cannot be saved. If I'm not in the body then I'm not part of the saved. As wives are called to submit to husbands, so must the church submit to Christ. As husbands are called to love their wives, Christ has demonstrated that perfect love by sacrificing Himself so that we can be made perfect. Jesus has to be head of the church. He has to be head here at Upland. Upland will never succeed. Upland, sure, could have more members. Upland could have a, a nicer building 
with, with nicer tech and, and nicer advertisement and, and just nicer this and nicer that. And, and Upland could be known all across the world as the greatest church this world has ever known. But if Jesus is not head of the church, Upland will never be successful. Is Christ the head of this congregation? Another question, is Jesus the head of your life? Is He Lord? Is He your number one priority? Is He your shepherd? Do you understand that what He does is for your protection? That not only what He does is for your protection, but that He equips you to be better, to do better. Do you understand that by Him being head over your life, that He is also your Savior? That at the end of time, it is not by your workings, it is not by your your merits that you're made perfect without spot. It is through Jesus that you are arrayed with splendor, that you are made holy, that you are presented faultless before the Lord. The Master's plan for the church is this. There is only one with all authority. It's not me. It's not the one who is in this pulpit. It's not the group of men who have been chosen to oversee the flock. There's only one. His name is Jesus. Are you a part of His plan? If you need anything this morning, if you need to make Christ Lord over your life, there's no reason to wait, no reason to hesitate except... Satan whispering in your ear. Make Christ Lord over your life. If you're struggling with Him being your ultimate priority, if you're a child of God, if you have been baptized into Christ, but you're still struggling with sin or struggling with making Him first, there's still time today. There's time now. Not only for you to make your life right, but to set the example for your family. Not only your physical family, but those here at Upland. If you just have a burden on your shoulders and you want to let God know about it and you want us to pray with you, we'd be happy to do that. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Come now while we stand and while we sing.